Hello everyone, this is Victor and here is an interesting mechanism challenge question I got from one of my students. While it was not originally a multiple choice question, I converted it to one based on our conversation and some common mistakes students can make while working through it. So pause this video, take a few moments to work through this question and then join me for the discussion as I walk you through the most reasonable steps in this reaction and show you the final answer. We'll start by analyzing our reagents. Sodium hydride is a very powerful base. And like in many cases with the introductory organic chemistry topics, the sodium ions participation in this reaction can be completely neglected. So I'm going to cross it out completely. And what's left is my hydride ion. And as I've mentioned a moment ago, hydrides are powerful bases. It's also important to note that simple hydrides like sodium or potassium or lithium hydrides are not particularly nucleophilic. Thus, I'm not going to be considering any kind of nucleophilic substitution with the hydride ion in this reaction whatsoever. So, since the hydride ion is a base, I'm going to look for the acidic protons in my molecule. I have two possible contestants here. By quickly checking the pKa table, we can find that the pKa values are quite different for those. The alcohol has a typical pKa of 16 to 18, while the alpha position of the ester is somewhere around 21 or so. And while we don't know the exact pKa values for this particular molecule, the typical values are good enough estimation for our purposes. Since the difference in our pKa values is quite significant, the difference of 3 units means that we have at least 1000 times difference in acidity, we can safely say that the deprotonation of the alpha position is going to be negligible compared to the deprotonation of the alcohol. So I'm going to start my reaction by deprotonation of my alcohol making the corresponding alkoxide. From this point, I have two possible options of what might happen next. First, we can have an attack by our nucleophile on the electrophilic carbon attached to the chlorine atom. This would yield a four-membered ring with oxygen. And while theoretically reactions like that are possible, they're exceptionally rare and oxetanes typically do not form from reactions like that. As a rule of thumb, always remember that making a four-membered ring is a very rare and unfavorable process and we only see those reactions in some exceptional cases. So, in other words, this pathway is unlikely. Another option would be the attack on the ester group which results in a tetrahedral intermediate that is characteristic for chemistry of carboxylic acids and their derivatives. And as this is a five-membered ring intermediate, there are no problems with its formation. And as our tetrahedral intermediate pushes the leaving group out to restore the carbonyl, we break the CO bond between the atoms 4 and 5. This essentially moves the acyl group from one oxygen of the molecule to another one. Now we have a nucleophilic oxygen right next to an electrophilic carbon with a leaving group. So this oxygen right here and this carbon down there, that is my electrophile, they're right next to each other. And because of that, we can easily do reaction between those two centers. So if I have a nucleophile and electrophile in a close proximity like that, reaction is going to be very easy. And unlike four-membered rings, three-membered rings close super easy due to this proximity. This gives me the resulting epoxide as the final product. Did you get the same product as I got here? Let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this little mechanism challenge, give it a like, hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any of my future challenges, and I'll see you in the next video.